actually how it all started was being born into a family of a father who did not know it was wrong for incest and a mother who was mentally ill. And I didn't know until just shortly before her death that she was borderline personality disorder. And then after she had died, I had been reading books on depression and come to find out my mother suffered from depression. And she was also very narcissistic. My father always traumatized us and thought it was funny. And he, back when we grew up, you know, it was okay to grab a switch off a tree or grab your belt and eat your kids till they're black and blue, literally, and with welts. So that's what I grew up with. I remember playing with my dolls and taking a pen or a scissor and stabbing their faces because I would always ask my mom, am I pretty? And she would never tell me because she had to be the prettiest. And then when my brother had moved out of the house, I was 15, is when my father and incest had started. He would get drunk at work, come home. My mother locked him out of the bedroom and he would come into my room. These feelings of not being accepted and not being protected started very young. Yes, they did. Um, I had abandonment issues for years. And my mother, see, I didn't know that my mother had left, but I would always have nightmares of my mom, my dad, and my brother all standing around in front of me. And I was set off to a place, but I couldn't get up from where I was moving. And they would walk off and leave me. And I would ask my mom, and she said, oh, you're just having nightmares. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that she told me that she had left my father for six months. Then I remember when she talked and I remembered her coming back and I remembered kicking my father's mother and telling her I hated her and that it was her, all her fault. And I can only piece that to when my mother was leaving and saying goodbye. So you didn't have any adult standing up for you or protecting you? No, I didn't. Actually, I did when we moved from Indiana to California. Southern California and my great uncle would stand up for me and everything and we got along really well. He, him and my great aunt were a great support system and then we ended up moving away and I was ripped out of my support system when I was six years old. So then I had literally nobody. So basically your self-esteem had no chance to mature properly. No, it didn't. And my mother would always tell me that I was ugly and my dad would tell me I wasn't good for anything and I would never amount to anything and that I was stupid and that I'd only be good to have babies and be married and that's it. The feelings of your self-worthlessness started because they felt worthless and they were projecting it onto you. It was their inner problem, their issue not yours. And it was when I was in my 30s, early 30s, uh, it's like when the book Women Who Love Too Much came out, there's a local support group. So that was the first time anything with dysfunction and self-help that really came into being. We're not talking like 28 years ago. And I started that and then I had been on my path of going to counseling, you know, to what is wrong with me, how can I fix me? Why do I keep getting into abusive relationships? So my family didn't want me to move out of their comfort zone to where they could control me. I was like a little puppet. Even my brother jumped in on, on the bandwagon for that. And I didn't live a lot of my life because I had been so beaten down and brainwashed that if I would step out of it, that I wouldn't have family to love me anymore and created a problem in you by making you believe it. People that lack self-esteem can be very cruel. People that lack self-esteem project that onto other people. They make other people feel worthless while the person that's doing that themselves has an inner crisis. And my mom had asked me one time as a teen, after my brother had moved out, is your father coming into your room? And at that point I had 
thought back about everything I had told her. I mean, he shot me in the breast with BBs. Um, he came, he would beat me. He would do other things. And I just, and I would tell her and she'd say, it's all your fault. And I even tried, I even ran away from home four times and my mom found me. So when she came and asked me that, I just looked right at her and I said, no, he's not. Because I thought, well, she's not going to believe me. You know, she didn't believe me all the other times. Why would she believe me now? So she said I should have said something, but it wasn't until my late 50s that she apologized only because my brother came forward and said all the stuff my dad did to him. And she said, I apologize to both of you. Had my brother not come forward, she never would have apologized. She must have been in a terrible state of tension and stress living with your father. And he with her, they both vied, yes, vied for the center of attention. And they always talked about getting a divorce, which led to insecurity. To help people regain their life, you've used the very pain of your own history. That is absolutely magnificent. You teach them to realize this is not your fault. This was the issue of your abuser projected onto you. It is not your fault. Tell me, Gloria, when did you first begin to realize that what happened to you was not your fault? Because when you did realize it, it created a whole turn in your life the same turn that you are now reaching out and giving to others. Tell us, please tell us about that. It wasn't until I was in my 40s because I had been fighting in my 30s. You know, with my, I had gotten multiple sclerosis. I was diagnosed when I was 30 years old. And I've had fibromyalgia since I was five. So I had medical issues to deal with on top of everything, plus the childhood diseases. I started counseling when I was 21, so I'm like 19 years down the road with off and on therapy that I finally went to a therapist that said, you know that none of this is your fault. And I had never even thought, and I burst into tears and I said, what? He said, none of this is your fault. So then from that point on, when my parents would say something, I'll say, it's not my fault, this is your issue. And I would start standing up. And even though they would be verbally abusive, I was able, you know, I was living in my own place. And for a period of time, I would have to live with them to get on my feet after, you know, medical issues and moving in with them so I could save up to be able to move out into an apartment and afford it. And they would just be browbeating me and beating me down and everything else. And I would ask them, I said, do I at least have some peace and quiet here? And they said, no. So I developed some friendships and I would stay overnight at a girlfriend's house. And sometimes I would stay over there for a week in her guest room just to get away from my family, just to be able to get strong and on my feet. And that's when I started fighting back was in my 30s. And then by the time I was in my 40s, I was strong enough. And my dad had already passed away. And I would say, okay, I don't have both of them you know, tag teaming, abusing me, I could just had my mom and she backed down at that point because she didn't have someone rallying around in her corner. And my brother at that point had disappeared from the family to go off and do his thing. So it's just my mom and I. So even though there was a love-hate relationship with both of us, with one another, it was more tolerable. And she would say, well, you don't tell me it's all my fault. And I sat down, tried to talk with her about it. And I said, Mom, if it, you know, it wasn't my fault. It was your fault and Dad's fault for doing whatever you did. And she would equate my talking back with being disrespectful. But I looked at her and I said, well, whose fault is it when an eight-year-old goes into the bathroom? Remember those big jars of Johnson baby um, aspirin? that you could get look like a big, huge gallon. Yeah. I would, I, eight years old, I went in and I chewed half of those up to kill myself. 
And I asked my mom, I said, do you know what ever happened to that bottle? She said, no. I said, I ate half of them. I felt myself getting drowsy. I went, remember laying on my bed and I was so upset that I came back from not overdosing on baby aspirin when I was eight. And I told her I took it. And that was my first attempt at suicide. And my second and last attempt, I was 25. So I told her, it, you know, I was in so much pain. I just wanted to be rid of all of them. And I said, it's not my fault, but I'm taking the responsibility to overcome what happened. Did your mom ever understand that? No, she never did. She was all my dad's fault and she did nothing wrong. With um, borderline personality disorder, it's always everyone else's fault and not theirs. That's their mental illness. And they stay in their comfort zone of mental illness, even though they're very tortured with what they're suffering from. I grew up in a culture where women had no rights. If my mom had stood up and tried to protect us in any way, she would have literally been in danger. I grew up in a cult where blind obedience was demanded and women obeyed their husbands no matter what their husbands did because it was a really precarious situation. If they didn't, it could literally get dangerous. They grew up believing they couldn't even get into heaven without their husband's permission. So that's an open door for a lot of emotional abuse. Strict and complete obedience to the men was literally a commandment of God. And I see parallels here as you talk about your mom. Even though you didn't grow up in a cult, there was a cultural thing going on then. Parallels here in my mother's depression, or in the Stockholm Syndrome, in blind obedience, in having to obey your husband and say nothing and don't make waves or you're not a good wife. The whole concept of backing and supporting your husband because you have to because you're not a good woman if you don't. You're not a good wife if you don't. You're not socially acceptable. You're supposed to bear anything and everything and say nothing if you're a good woman. There were so many women then that backed and supported their husbands even though their husband was their persecutor. They didn't know what else to do. So much of our culture taught that not just in cults, it was taught that that was a woman's place in lots of cultures in the world, not just ours. It's not a new concept. That's what it sounded like with my mom. And I asked her one time, why didn't you leave dad? She said, because I didn't want to live alone. And months before she passed away, she had told my brother about this very wealthy man that she had dated. And she said, looked at me and him and said, I wonder if it would have been different had I married him. She always thought that if she married someone else, they would make her happiness for her instead of her being happy herself. Unfortunately, this is way too common. We don't talk about it that much. Parallels into my life and to the lives of many women. Women where I grew up were taught that they could not strive for or maintain their own happiness, that to do such a thing was totally selfish, they had to sacrifice their life to their family and their husband, that their desire was to be for their husband only, that they were to build their life around him and his needs, and he came first, the family came first, and most of the time she just didn't come into place for any personal thing until after everyone else was taken care of, if it worked at all. It was just the way we were brought up. Women were taught that their happiness depended on somebody else. That they didn't have a right to pursue their own happiness. It depended more often than not on their husband. So the husband came first. And if they didn't have a husband to make him happy, they were inadequate as a woman. And many, many women believed exactly that. So they weren't about ready to complain when they didn't see any other way to live or survive or take care of their children. 
This is one of the big problems that we have had about domestic abuse. Just denying it and pretending it doesn't exist because people don't know how to deal with it, particularly the women that are caught up in it. Do you think that that was really a generational thing more than not? I think it may have been a generational thing because women were urged to get married um, right away. That's what you did. You got married, you had kids, and you learned to like each other. But I'm listening to the book Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedman. And it talks about the generations of women being, it's, they were called it the housewife syndrome. It was, it's what society put out there. You have your kids, you keep your house, you do this, whether you like it or not, and you stay quiet about it. So I, it was society for, for generations. That's what they did. It's not fair. You, we have a voice. We do amount to something. Accept ourselves. Learn to love ourselves. Learn to approve of who we are. Accept our body the way it is. Stop cutting. Stop abusing ourselves. Stop slamming ourselves into walls. You know, overeating, undereating, all of that. Stop cutting our hair and making ourselves look ugly just because we want we don't want people to look at us and hide. We want, just want to people to leave us alone because we're hiding behind our destruction. I did. I looked at men as my rescuer, even though my father was my abuser, I wanted to be rescued. And now I'm 58 years old as of this airing. And I don't want a man to rescue me. I don't want a man in my life. I, you know, it's just like, I enjoy living alone because I finally accepted myself. My life is blooming and going the way I like it. And I even had a man say, well, you shouldn't say that. And I'm thinking, why? And then he said, well, you shouldn't say that. You don't like being in a relationship. You shouldn't say this. And I thought, now I know why you're not in a relationship because you have control issues. You know, that kind of domineering. I'm wondering, does he have, is he an abuser? Because he wants you to wrap your world around him he wants everything to be his way. And I had a man tell me recently that you're being demanding, wanting to live your own life. And I said, no, I'm celebrating me by living my own life. And it's very unfair and macho of you to want a woman to wrap everything around you and have no other interests but you. And I'm thinking this man's in his 60s and I'm thinking of how archaic that he has not even evolved into allowing another person to be their own person. Thank you so much for being a guest on this show. It's been my pleasure, Rebecca. It really is, and I'm glad that you've asked me because my legacy is whatever I can leave behind for people to heal and to be inspired and motivated. That is what I want to do. Thank you. Self-sacrifice. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? Well, in our case, it's because it was ingrained in us as children. Yes, that's true. You know, it was like, that's what you had to do. A woman had to sacrifice herself to death because that's... Well, what we did. Well, yeah, we were taught that we had a prepaid one-way ticket to hell. If we didn't, we didn't have a choice. Yeah. We were wicked if we didn't. Oh, if you even had an opinion of your own, <laughs> you go to hell just for having an opinion. Yeah, thou shalt not think. Rule number one. <laughs> Blind obedience. It looks like it's caring, but it's depleting even for them. Mm -hmm. You know, the sad thing about it, a child can feel that when mom's too tired to really bother with them, mm -hmm. when she's so exhausted that she just wishes she could go to her room and cry, a child can feel that. Now, what does that do to the kid's head? They, they know they're not loved. Either that or they grow up thinking, well, that's what women are for. They should suffer like that. Mm. They're lesser human beings. And here we come back to the original statement. Less than. Less than being less than nobody's less than it's a myth right so we need to stop holding ourselves in that position of less than 
It's terribly important for the health of the family. The for person, humanity, to quite the, honestly. The nation, yes, for humanity. For, for the entire planet, we need to stop holding ourselves as less than. That's mom suffered from depression and looked forward to death as a liberator to get her out of polygamy because it was the only way. And she really believed that she couldn't have anything nice because it would be evil. She couldn't do anything that was fun or nice because it would be evil. And she was totally, totally depressed and non-functioning with depression and not even there for us with depression. So where did the self-sacrifice get her? Yeah, apparently she thinks it's going to earn her a greater reward in heaven. I mean, I, re I remember believing that when I was a kid. But I remember the being the more you suffer in life, the greater your reward exactly, in heaven. Exactly, that's what they taught us. And suffering was really cherished, especially suffering of women. Yeah, women. I should mean, they suffer. wore it like a badge of honor. How right. much they suffered. Right. Yeah. My goodness, that's a pathetic thing. It is. That's really sad. So you go through life being completely empty, completely depleted, as absolutely nothing of you. And we were expected to believe that that's what earned us a better place in heaven. And that's what a good woman did. And that's what a good woman did, was gave herself to death. Right. And so a good woman, if she doesn't value herself, she can't value her life, so she can't function properly in her own life to really give. It's mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. Mom couldn't. Mm -mm. And I don't ever recall mom taking her depression and turning it negatively, but she wasn't there for us. And that was turning it negatively in a different way. Right. Not in abuse and words, but she wasn't there for us. She actually wasn't there. She was too depressed. She just internalized everything. Right. Yeah, I think my mom did that too. Yeah. Very, very sad. Just, just gave up. She had no opinion. She had no voice. She had no value except to die for everybody else, and maybe she'd get in heaven. Yep. That's really sad. It's very sad. And a lot of women today still do that to, to an extent. And I think they need to sacrifice their happiness for the happiness of others. Living in servitude, it comes from depletion. Mm -hmm. Profound statement. How many women out there are listening? are living in servitude a lot yeah and a lot of them truly believe just like we did the way we were taught that that's what a good woman does mm -hmm. she overlooks anything and any injustices and any disrespect done to her and cries about it alone if she cries about it or internalizes it and just keeps her mouth shut and sacrifices more that is gradually killing a person because mm -hmm. you say they give pieces of themselves until they're gone right and and what it does is it manifests as disease well i think just cancer in general it, it's it, a lot of our diseases are stress related oh like, yeah that yeah all of our i think um, like 98 percent of our diseases are stress related and that comes from I mean, what higher stress is there than giving yourself to death? Right. Stress is an interesting thing on women's bodies. It affects us very differently. It also causes body fat. Huh. Interestingly enough. <laughs> yeah, there was some, can, some research that was done recently about that. I can see that because on Sister Wife show, Cody Brown, mm -hmm. when he took his fourth wife, Robin, into their polygamous family, all three of his other wives got fat. <laughs> right Either away. that or it's because TLC was paying him a lot of money. Well, interesting timing. They still had TLC before they had Robin. Robin was evidently very fattening for that family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't get fat, but all the other girls did. And, and it's... You know. That's interesting. Well, the three the three other girls kind of all grew up together, and they they had always known polygamy. That was normal for that was what their brand of normal was. Right. 
So, you know, they married into that because it was part of their belief system and they believe that they can't go to heaven without it. Right. Of course, they conveniently never mentioned on their show, but they really believe they can't go to heaven without polygamy. And, but, but I think because they all got married at about the same time, they were kind of grew up together. We're bringing this fourth woman into it who is a lot prettier than they are. Sorry, ladies, but she is a lot prettier. And she upset the dynamics. Yes. And they all gained weight. Yeah. Because of the stress. It uh, upsets the cortisol level in a woman's body and creates body fat, um, belly fat. So then, it isn't what the woman is eating that's causing the problem. It's what's eating her. <laughs> Uh, in a way, yes. I guess you could say that. That's funny. <laughs> Women by nature are cooperative unless something is wrong. Right. Of course, now in polygamy, that's not true because they're competitive no. because they have to be. They get less and less and less of a husband every time he marries. Right. And they're, so what, what, yeah. what's interesting with the dynamics of polygamy is that it keeps women small, not, not physically, obviously, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, creating that environment of competition doesn't allow women to thrive. Yeah, I can see that. Because uh, women can't, don't thrive. It, competition is, is more of a masculine thing. And so competition for men actually becomes a game for them. Well, competition pits women against each other. That's not their natural environment. Women are much more collaborative. And in an environment where they're constantly battling for the husband's attention, they are, they can't ever truly be who they are as women to the extent that women have the ability to be because they're always under guard. Well, for starters, their hearts are always on guard. Right. They, they can't. They can't have a loving relationship with themselves because there's... Not, not only their immediate family, but they're also, also this extended family they have to sacrifice themselves for. They actually have to sacrifice their happiness for that. Yes, they do. Yes, they have to sacrifice their happiness because it's natural instinct for everyone to want to love and be loved by somebody that will be loyal to them and dedicated to them. And polygamous women are never going to get that. Right. And if they happen to get a paycheck, they have to sacrifice that too. Right. They, if they're one of the few women that can actually go get a job, they have to turn over their paycheck. Right. Even. So they sacrifice everything for that kind of lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. And so there's, uh, since they don't believe in any form of birth control, there's all the sacrificing for all the children that are way beyond their means to take care of, and it just uh, doesn't get any better. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's yeah. that's really an extreme version. You know that that particular lifestyle that we both grew up with is really an extreme version of what self sacrifice turns into. Right. And these are women who are basically go through life completely numb. This is the only way you can survive is just to shut your heart off completely.